covered the Aliens comics, the Predator comics, Aliens versus Predator comics. That's got to be it, right? Please, sir. I want some more. More? All right, all right, all right. As promised, let's take a look at the crazy assortment of Xenomorph and Predator crossovers with other licenses. I guess deep down, I always knew it would lead to this. Dark Horse's history with pitting aliens and predators against other licensed characters goes back 26 years. Reading them all will expose you to a pretty random menagerie of characters and creative teams that you may not have otherwise. And that is what's cool about them. You might have never entertained the idea of reading an Archie, Tarzan, or Vampirella comic before, but these crossovers can function as sort of a sampler plate of stuff you've never tasted, accompanied by a comfort food you've been eating all your life. However, the first crossover with another publisher was decidedly not so random. I mean, if you could cross Predator over with any other character in the world of comic books, who would you choose? What? What character were you thinking of? Well, that might be pretty cool, but no, not today. The year after Dark Horse discovered it had a smash hit on its hands, mashing up its two licensed extraterrestrials, two years after Tim Burton's blockbuster Batman movie, and one year after Predator 2 hit theaters, Dark Horse publisher Mike Richardson coordinated the crossover that made the most sense. Batman vs. Predator. The series editor from the DC side was Denny O'Neill, a legendary Batman scribe who, together with Neil Adams, actually deserve all the credit for bringing Batman back to his darker roots after the Silver Age. Seriously. Frank Miller often gets all the credit for re-establishing Batman as the Dark Knight, but at the 75th anniversary Batman panel at Comic-Con, Miller spent most of the panel fawning over Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams, uh, two guys I bet a lot of the audience were unfamiliar with. He was basically saying, Hey, I know you guys like my stuff, but I prayed to these guys' as altar. Anyway, Denny knows what he's talking about when it comes to Batman, and of the mashup with Predator, he said the following. The only test I've ever found for judging the artistic credibility for using a character from one fictional universe in another universe is this. If the character were presented fresh as a new creation, would it be acceptable? Even if science fiction aliens and such are not traditionally a Batman thing, villains who are hunters like Kraven in the Spider-Man comics are typically safe territory. Also, the parallels between Batman and Predator play really nicely into the mono e mono mold from the Predator films. They're both hunters of a sort, stalking their prey from concealed vantage points, often picking off people in a party one by one. They also both love their gadgets. Batman also has parallels with Dutch, as they are both highly trained individuals with a talent for combat and improvisation. So yeah, the Predator character is both a good character companion and good character foil for Batman. Along with DC editor Denny O'Neill and Aliens vs. Predator editor Diana Schultz, a creative team was assembled that really understood how to run with the idea, including Dave Gibbons on writing duties. Most people probably think of Gibbons as an artist, second build on copies of Watchmen, but he is a solid writer in his own right. As an artist, he has a unique perspective when working with other artists, and since he is more of a functional artist than a stylistic one, i.e. his art is best applied to conveying story rather than adorning covers, it follows that he understands the mechanics of storytelling. Part of the reason Gibbons took the job was the opportunity to write for the Kubert brothers, Andy on pencils and Adam on inks. Andy and Adam Kubert are the sons of Joe Kubert, a legit legend in the comic industry, but they have both distinguished themselves with their own unique styles. Andy particularly making a name for himself on the X-Men books throughout the 90s. Even though Batman vs. Predator is some of Andy's earliest work, his talent for unique visuals and cool silhouettes is evident, and I've always dug the way Andy Kubert draws Batman, especially after drawing two of my favorite Batman stories, Batman and Son, and whatever happened to the Cape Crusader. The setup for Batman vs. Predator isn't complicated. Gotham City is having a heat wave, and a Predator arrives for some hunting. The plot revolves around two rival big-time gangsters who have gone legitimate, and now instead of taking shots at each other in the street, they hire boxers to take shots at each other in the ring. While the high-profile boxing match holds all of Gotham's attention, it follows that the gladiatorial show of martial prowess would also attract Gotham's new visitor. The structure of Gibbon's story is a melding of things Batman and Predator fans are already familiar with. The Predator mixes it up with rival gangs just like in Predator 2, and just like Batman's arc with the mutant leader in Dark Knight Returns, he gets his ass handed to him in round one, requiring him to recuperate while the monster goes on to terrorize Gotham in his absence. 
Having learned his lessons, Batman then brings the fight back to the Predator on his own terms. The last issue also feels like the last act of the first Predator movie, with Dutch putting the hunter right where he wants him on his own terms to even the odds a little when they get back in the ring. The boxing match Gibbons decides to open with sets the tone for the whole series, both in that mono -y mono sense I mentioned before, as well as a general theme of sports and competition present throughout, culminating in Batman beating ass with a literal baseball bat. Because he's the Bat-Man. Bat-Man. You get it? You get it. It was there in the movie as well, that sense of macho competition, but less overt. You son of a bitch. Had enough? Make it easy on yourself, Dutch. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, maybe really actually super overt in places. With the boxing match, Gibbons brings it more stage center. The boxers are competitors, but they're also dick measurers for their respective sponsors slash gang leaders. The Predator character also gets into the competitive groove quickly, repeating phrases like next round, championship, and kick butt. The other element of the machismo theme Gibbons highlights is the idea of the hunt. With the Predator character, that obviously comes with the territory. But I think Gibbons is also getting at something pertaining to the Predator, not just as a hunter, but as a villain. Because one way to create a bad guy is to make him scary, but you can also make him unlikable. What I mean is, for all the talk of the Predator's code of honor and whatnot, they bring enough ridiculously powerful alien tech to the hunt that it's kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. It makes you think of human hunters who bring the full force of human ingenuity to bear on a species who barely know what the hell is going on before- BAM! A fucking bullet rips off part of your head. Your brains are laying on the ground in little bloody pieces. Gibbons telegraphs this idea the most in a scene between Alfred and Bruce, in which they agree that Grandfather Wayne's prize heads should be moved out of the mansion. Gibbons doubles down by having Alfred quote Oscar Wilde, defining prize hunting as the unspeakable in the pursuit of the uneatable. In other words, for a noble warrior and hunter, this Predator character sure doesn't fight fair. He even kills a harmless street cat and a junkyard dog. And you know what that means for another inevitable crossover. Anyway, he's kind of an asshole. Yeah, that's right, I said it. What are you gonna do? You're a foot tall made out of plastic. You look pretty cool though. But Batman's not an asshole, and that's what sets the two hunters apart. Batman hunts and fights with a noble purpose, and as Alfred puts it, the Predator is a big bully. Threading these familiar elements from both franchises together allows the story to feel like both a good Predator story and a good Batman story. But it's also the visual aesthetic. Of this series, Gibbons has said, with Gotham City, you've got the perfect hunting ground. It's kind of a surreal, gloomy place. Together with colorist Sherilyn Van Valkenburg, the Kubert brothers do a great job of realizing Gotham as a surreal, gloomy place. The liberal use of smoke, steam, and shadows gives everything the gothic look a Batman story should have. It's like they had the iconic cover to Detective Number 31 in the back of their heads at all times. It also allows the Predator to be scary and intimidating. The decision to convey the Predator's invisibility as a solid white color emphasizes his look as spectral, and ghosts fit right in with the gothic vibe they're going for. However, since Batman is supposed to be something like a supernatural creature of the night himself, the series becomes a kind of a contest of boogeymen. Check out these panels. This one at the bottom of the page. It's a classic scary I am the knight Batman silhouette, probably riffing on Mazzucchelli from year one. So on the next page, we get this huge looming figure of the Predator rising up behind Batman as if to say, are you sure you're the knight? Because I'm pretty fucking scary. Of course, none of this would amount to a good Predator story if Dave Gibbons and Andy Kuber didn't deliver good action scenes. And well, they do. The best of it is in the final showdown of the last issue. One of the things I love about my favorite action movies is their dynamism. Look at something like The Raid, where the context of the combat is constantly changing. What begins with firearms moves on to hand-to-hand -hand combat in tight spaces with weapons, and then moves on to pure fisticuffs. The environment is always changing, giving us new set pieces that can influence the logic of the action. In the final throwdown in the comic, we begin on the roof of Gotham Police Department, and the fight makes its way to the surrounding area of Wayne Manor, and then the Batcave before it's over. It's also dynamic in how it mixes up the situation with different physical elements, whether they be weapons or just objects in the environment. They act as variables, constantly shifting the conflict into something new. Without going into too much detail, here's just a list of the elements used in the final fight. Predator Blade, Shoulder Cannon, 
Batarang, Wrist Claw Thing, Death Frisbee, Batmobile, Bats, Traps, Tranquilizer Gun, Giant Bomb, Giant Penny, Blunderbuss, and how can we forget the baseball bat? Let's take a look at an earlier action sequence where the words, illustrations, compositions, layouts, and even the lettering all do a beautiful dance with each other. This scene takes place after Batman has figured out where the Predator has been hiding out, an old junkyard. We start with an establishing shot that sets the mood, dark, quiet, and empty. Next page, first panel, we have Batman small in the frame, the ominous closed keep out sign taking up most of the panel. Even smaller in the frame is the snick sound effect accompanying his bolt cutters, giving us a barometer for volume. In fact, it's so quiet that we can hear the TV from outside the trailer in the next panel. The speech balloon simulates TV interference to let us know it's not a character speaking. We can tell from the dialogue, you did what with that pot roast? That it must be some kind of sitcom, which provides a nice ironic countertone to the scene and will soon operate as a pseudo narration for the action about to unfold. Next panel, we can tell from the blinds above Batman's head that he's now right outside the trailer and the sitcom dialogue sets us up for some gruesome juxtaposition putting words in our head like pot roast and give your father for dinner before we get panel four, a set piece worthy of seven. Gibbons really hammers in the counter tonal irony here by adding the laugh track. There's so much awfulness in this shot, you almost miss Batman peeking in through the window in the back, caught between the two hanging corpses, giving us another ominous visual of what could be his fate. Next panel, another sound is introduced, and it's twice as big as the sound effect used earlier, so we know it's louder. This means that whatever made this sound was not trying to be as quiet as Batman was. Kubert draws Batman's eyes over his right shoulder to show us that he's registered the sound and it's not coming from inside the trailer. Gibbons continues to have fun with the sitcom, using the line, oh no, that's him now. The next panel, we just get a pair of feet trailing bright green blood in case it wasn't obvious. We can see from the angle and the positioning of the feet that he's making no attempt to sneak over to the trailer like we just saw Batman do. He's confident that he's alone, and so he takes off his helmet. The accompanying sitcom dialogue, hello dear, good day at the office, is great. It brings up images of a housewife greeting her husband from a long day at work, which is sort of what's happening here. The Predator's kind of beat up and he's finally home with the trailer's previous resident, a working class Joe hanging dead inside. Next page and we have a hunched over tired Predator nursing an injured leg, surrounded on both sides by Batman panels. The layout conveys Batman has his quarry dead to rights. Another great illustration here from Kubert, getting the Predator's awareness and his line of sight all in a very small frame. Then Batman throwing some kind of gas. Notice how small Batman is in the panel compared to the Predator. Compare this to the slumped figure up here with Batman on both sides. Here he's a giant and perhaps Batman has underestimated his advantage. And yes, he has. The Predator throws his death frisbee, injuring Batman accompanied by the laugh track again to show the joke's now on him. Next page, now the Predator is towering over that entire page, refusing to even be contained by his panel. What little we see of Batman is small in the frame and near the Predator's feet, liable to be stepped on, metaphorically speaking. Cuber only shows us his cape, the rest of them disappearing behind a car. Notice the only sound effect we get is the death frisbee returning to the Predator because Batman is a stealthy ninja. Next two panels give us Predator tracking Batman's blood so we know he's hurt. We see Batman throw a lug nut and a sound ringing out in the quiet with a very suspicious reaction from the Predator. The Predator investigates soundlessly and ends up small in the frame underneath a crane. Reaction facing up so we put two and two together. Interior shot to show us Batman is really hurt and he knows how to do everything, including how to operate junkyard cranes. Then big payoff panel with the biggest sound effect we've gotten this whole sequence. These pages are doing all kinds of cool stuff, but what I like most about it is how it's such a good example of escalating the tension and action through sound in a soundless medium. Look at the size of all these sound effects and how they increase in size and intensity. Good stuff. In case it wasn't clear from this extended sequence, this crossover, it's the best of the bunch. Coincidentally, it was also the very first crossover with other licenses. So it came out of the gate and set the bar extremely high. All this means it warranted its own video. That's not to say that none of the other mashups aren't great as well, but this one is just special in a way that it deserves a little extra love. So maybe you're running out to buy it now, but unfortunately it's been out of print for a while. 
However, with all the Aliens and Predator reprinting Dark Horse has been doing lately, it might not be too much to hope for a nice deluxe hardcover. I already have a space set up for it right here. All right, stay tuned for part two. Uh, other way, we have a lot of British viewers. Part two of our crossover tour, where we'll go over the rest, including Archie, Vampirella, Terminator, Green Lantern, Superman, Judge Dredd, and more. There are some gems, some rusty pennies, and some straight up turds that you do not want to touch, but we'll touch them for you. Speaking of turds, do predators poop?